Welcome to the Queen Trail Podcast. There are three different types of radiation, alpha, beta, and gamma. What does this technology do? It's like, well, what can you do with electricity? I just survived 30 years HIV positive. I'm certainly not going to let a little thing like a brain tumor derail me. When I got to 29 pounds, I was so tired, I just collapsed. Everything always goes back to being grounded and centered. It's a mecca for cycling, for sure. Struggle is the neutralizing force. And I said, there it is. This is the right family. I'm, I got like cold chills. And- it's one lone oak tree right in the middle of the trail. It's beautiful. Hey everyone, I hope you had a good week since the last time that we got together. I am super excited to present this episode to you today, so I am going to forego any updates on myself and what went on this last week in the interest of time. This is a pretty long episode. It has everything in it, jam-packed full of everything you want to know about films and filmmaking. Um, It's with my friend, Danny Miguel, who is a film writer, director, producer, editor. He just finished his latest project, which is a documentary called The Mexican Express. And it's about race car drivers in the 1960s, locally here in Long Beach and Wilmington, California. He is absolutely the most conscientious, methodical thoughtful, intrepid, spontaneous filmmaker that I know. He has so much information in here for anybody who is interested in filmmaking or just interested in knowing more about the process, the inner workings of a filmmaker's mind, how film ideas get started and then get blown up to the point that they end up on a screen or a streaming service. This is the episode for you. So please grab a cuppa, pop some popcorn, and join Danny Miguel and me in this In the Company of Friends talk. All right, we should be smooth sailing. Yay. Okay. (laughs) Danny Miguel is a film writer, a director, a producer, an editor. He's the director of an upcoming film, which is currently untitled, and a couple of completed shorts, one of which I had the pleasure of working with him on. He's also um, completed a full-length documentary, which is currently in post-production, He's written and edited three projects and worked in various capacities on numerous projects, including production manager on Different Eye, which was created and directed by the awesome John Luxetich, who is a mutual friend of ours, and which is currently available on Amazon Prime, as well as being the DP. And for anybody who is not familiar with Film Talk, DP is the director of photography, or the cameraman <laughs> for a short that's called Cranky, which was created <laughs> and directed by the illustrious Julian V. Hampton, which you and I both worked on. And Danny's a graduate of Cal State Long Beach in film and video production. And his motto is, quote, living by artistry and ambition and viewing challenges as opportunities and quote in everything that he does. I just have to say, just to give you everybody an idea of what it's like to meet Danny. It's like you are immediately absorbed as family. He is so warm and passionate and thoughtful. He's a visionary. Uh, He always has a kind word and, just is always thinking a step ahead of everything. And I am so excited to get to hang out with him on this episode of In the Company of Friends. So come join us for a talk with Danny Miguel. Hey, everybody. I'm glad to be part of this podcast. I am so excited that you're here. Like I said, it's just so awesome to get to hang out with you again. And You always have so much insight into film and life in general, and just really just such a calm, grounding quality about you. So thanks for joining me today. Yeah, absolutely. Congrats on on making this far in um, the Queen Trail Productions. Thank you. It's been been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. And um, 
it's still a learning process. It's still evolving. I'm I'm surprised how how thorough it is, and uh, thank you. You, uh, I like your your research you've done. It's like it's like we're preparing for like a like a movie and stuff, or or a table read. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, thank you. You're welcome. I've got so much to cover with you, so I think I'm just going to start at the beginning. When did you know that you wanted to pursue a career in film? It was around uh, 2000. Five when I wanted to pursue a film, I was uh I was overwhelmed at, of the entertainment art program at uh, Cal State Fullerton, and I was involved in like the I wanted to get into video games and the the animation department was a uh, whoa it was just kind of out there, just uh, a lot of a lot of overtime and on the computers, way too much time looking at screens and uh, I always had film as a backup major and I think that summer I took an international film class at the radio TV department. And that's when I realized, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go uh, switch to film. And uh, Cal State Long Beach, it's, it's a little closer to home. I'm going to give it a shot. I called the department, and it was the front desk lady who works there to this day, the wonderful lady, Donna Thomas. She sent me a brochure. And uh, I know I still have that brochure somewhere in my house, but that's kind of like, okay, yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to transfer. I'm going to transfer to Cal State Long Beach. Eventually, I got my uh, acceptance letter, pre-film electronic arts. I started in uh, 2006 in the theory portion of the program, not knowing I was going to get into production yet. But uh, theory was a, a wonderful place to immerse yourself and watch a lot of movies and you know, just learn about the media and, and you know video production in general. I can imagine, you know, after being overwhelmed in one part of entertainment, finding your niche in another part of it. Yeah. That's really awesome. Um, who would you say were the people that influenced you the most um, in terms of, of your filmmaking approach and techniques? Would you say like, uh, all right, I guess in my in my formative years, in from like the late late eighties, early nineties, I was always into the movies that you remember when you walk out in the theater when you're a kid from, you know, Terminator Two. And then fast forwarding to the 2000s with like Gladiator. Uh, oh yeah, and then going back to The Rock, uh, Gone in 60 Seconds. So you know, you know, guys like a lot of the the, the blockbuster movies, the, the Jerry Bruckheimer and the late Don Simpson. I was into those kind of movies before I got into film school. That was kind of like how I wanted to get into film. And then what film school does to you is you get a, you get influenced by a lot of the the international classes, uh, guys from like. Uh, French, Italian cinema, uh, guys like uh, Godard, uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, uh, Jean-Pierre Melville, and uh, there's a lot of uh, won wonderful movies. So I got influenced by a lot of those guys. And then dialing it down even more, um, a lot of the classes from 1970s uh, films uh, kind of inspired me. And at Cal State Long Beach, all the books that we read, you always hear the same three or four names, and it was uh, Steven Spielberg, uh, Coppola, and uh, Scorsese. And uh, there's something about the 1970s films at that time, you know, with Vietnam, and it was a time when directors can have full control of their films, not the studios. They can finally have full control of their films. And I quote from um, the book by Peter Biskine, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, and he says in the 70s, European innovation entering American filmmaking. So I guess to answer your question, yeah, it's, it's kind of a mix of like, you know, like the, the blockbuster movies uh, to like the Italian films, uh, French films, a lot of international films to um, to a lot of the 1970s guys in America. So, yeah. That's quite a scope. And um, <laughs> honestly, you're just taking the best parts out of each one of those and kind of mashing it up and turning it into something that's completely uniquely yours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you went on and you started creating these projects and your, your first project was a senior thesis project, um, which is an espionage film and you wrote it and you edited it and it was shot over a three day period in 2009 like a month before he graduated 
<laughs> and then in 2011, you decided to add to it and shot an additional two days before entering it into film festival circuits. And this first collaboration earned you a silver award in the Chautauqua International Film Festival in 2016, which is amazing. So tell me about Discredit, as it was called. How did it come together? All right. So it was uh, 2007. I got my first year into uh, the production track because after the theory track, you get interviews to get into the CSUOB production option, which gets you a chance to be working on set. And uh, we took a directing course, just how to work with actors, like with the theater department and stuff. And uh, I was asked to write a screenplay. Uh, I did want to write a screenplay based off this book that I bought by James Patterson, a, a thriller anthology. So anyways, I, I kept that in the back of my head, like, man, I want to adapt one of these stories one day. I can't do it right now because I don't have the resources yet. So, okay, so fast forward to 2008, they tell you that, okay, uh, 2009, you're going to graduate. So so the narrative track is, the, the first part of the narrative track is the first semester you write a screenplay, and then the second semester you, you shoot it. And <laughs> it became really personal. I kept switching majors. If I'm going to graduate college, I got to end off with something, you know, pretty, you know, at least ambi ambitious at the time, you know, for whatever discredit is worth now, I had, I had a great time doing it. So anyways. Go out with a bang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to answer your question, um, there was there was two stories from the thriller anthology called um, "The Hunt for Dimitri." These all these are all short stories. It was written by uh, um, I think it was Gail Linz about a uh, a KGB agent who was masquerading as a like a Russian philosopher, I think, and this person was trying to kill someone. And they had a, they basically they're trying to hunt the hunted. They're trying to like make sure this person they get to take this person out. And then there was another story. It was called Falling by Chris Mooney about a young woman who had to plant a device on a wanted fugitive. She had to like really it was kind of like a little James Bondish, but it was very like introspective. And that's what I liked about these stories. Okay, I got I got to write something like that. And uh, I finished a screenplay, and I think it was early 2009 just around the time when we were supposed to start shooting. And so uh, really stressful moments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just had to like, okay, I got to start putting in some action. I got the screenplay going on. We haven't started casting yet, but I would think I was driving around the city of Carson. I was playing some music uh, from the soundtrack from uh, Public Enemies, yeah. which came out that year by uh, Michael Mann, one of my, uh, yeah, definitely one of my icons, one of my heroes. And uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to walk into the Civic Center and location scout a conference room for the story, for the screenplay that I wrote, Discredit. That's the name of the screenplay. And uh, that's that's kind of like the main focus. OK, I, got, I just got to do it. You know, I know it's going to take a while, but you got to take that first step. Start location scouting. I walked around the Civic Center, took some photos and I found a conference room that I really like. I just after that, you know, you go through pre-production. And that's when I uh, I got to work with Chad again, Chad Peters. This will yes. be our second film together. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Chad. Yeah, he's an awesome DP for sure. Yeah. So fast forward to uh, production. Yeah, we, we shot uh, about three days of it. We were supposed to shoot the remaining two, but what, what happens a lot with independent films or, or student films, <laughs> you run out of money, mm -hmm. you run out of time. And before you know it, you, you got to graduate. And uh <laughs> and there you were yeah so uh what grade did you get on it if you don't mind me asking i think i got a uh b i got a b nice i got a b yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you know group projects are always um you're never sure what you're going to get on a group project because it's it's the overall grade and, you know, you put your all into it. And if one person just kind of had an off day or, you know, didn't didn't put in as much of an effort that brings it down and you're just like, oh, it's such a nail biter when you have even even when everybody does the best that they can, you know, it's just such yeah. a nail biter. So that's great. Um what do you think were some of the most notable challenges with that project? Some of the most uh, notable challenges. Well, let's see. Learning to uh, learning to take two steps back with your uh, with your priorities and your schedule. Um, 
I'll, I'll give an example. I, there was one day I was with my uh, my assistant director, who was pretty much like my right hand man. His name is Adam Schwartz, and uh, we were doing the shot list the same night. I had to do some quote unquote surveillance pickups with some actor guards that same day, just like recorded on a cheap video camera. And I remember it was it was getting late. We were probably like the last ones in the library, and there was a part where I was like, I was about to faint. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, and Adam saw me. He's like, hey, man, are you okay? Like, yeah, yeah. And uh, it kind of reminded me when um, I got into this crazy car accident in 2007. And I felt the same way when, like, uh-oh, what if this happens again? So <laughs> I just had to, like, I just had to relax, get some food at the uh, at the college cafe. And me and Adam were just, you know, we're going to do this together. So I guess one of the first challenges is to, uh, you know, s- schedule things lightly. Don't assume like everything's going to go to plan. No, things are going to change and don't, ju- don't jam everything in the same time. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was, I guess, kind of my fault for like, yeah, we'll just wing the shot list. And Adam, Adam's like, no, we got to go through all of it, all of it. So he was right. Um, that's the first challenge just being better at, at scheduling and prioritizing the second challenge. So I think it was the, uh, our first day of shooting was, you know, smooth sailing. Uh, the second day was like, total opposite i think on the on the before we got to the first shot we didn't have like our our batteries right now with the sound um the lunch came late and this was for like a more elaborate like action set piece when uh my lead actor don donnie boas who walks into a a building and he has to bypass like two guards and you know there's a lot of a lot of moving parts and i just I was just off melody that night. <laughs> I could see the actor was frustrated. Chad was frustrated. And uh, luckily I had my production designer, Chris Hidalgo, was beside me the whole time. And hey, man, we'll make it through this night. And so I guess it was that, that second it was that second day of shooting. The, uh, that's, that was the second challenge. Just, uh, you know, trying to get myself together, being more prepared for the second day. The th- third challenge was uh, reuniting the comeback tour. Because, you know, everyone already graduated. Um, you know, people have lives now. They have, like, actual jobs in the industry. So I was able to get some people back. And uh, Donnie, my my lead, he uh, he moved to Texas. So <laughs> wow. I had to fly him out. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Cody, who plays the antagonist, Cody Rain Murray, he, he still lived in L.A., so that was, that was an ease for us. Just uh, doing everything, uh, getting everybody was a challenge but it all it all really worked out at the end when you're arriving on set and everything's putting together that's like oh, that's a great feeling right there and you you probably remember some experiences like that <laughs> oh yeah i mean yeah you know one of the things that i always say is everything's going to take longer than you expect it to take so it's i'm listening to you and i've been in those experiences where you know a certain amount of time is allotted for a scene and you just know 40 minutes is not enough for the scene, even though there's not a ton of action in it, especially when you're doing something that's low budget um, or, you know, indie style where you've got the one DP and you've got, you know, just one of everybody, you don't have two crews. And so you've got to set everything up from one angle And then you've got to dismantle all of that and go around and set it up from the other (laughs) angle. And now you're looking at really, you know, you've got to double everything and you've got to, um, like you said, you know, those are things that I think that everybody needs to learn early on um, and often from experience, because those are the most lasting lessons, right? (laughs) When you're like, oh my God, none of this is working. I'm never going to do this again just having too much jam packed into a day doesn't give you wiggle room for those little things like the late lunch or, you know, you missed lunch, you missed lunch the one day and you probably didn't have enough water and you were probably really tired. And then, you know, whatever else was going on and you almost fainted. So yeah. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's really awesome when, when everything goes according to plan or you have that little bit of, extra wiggle room in there so that you can make sure that you're giving the attention that each scene and each character deserves. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's that right. always, yeah, that always makes it a lot better. But in the end, despite all of those obstacles or roadblocks or whatever you want to call them, you guys yeah. worked through it so well that you ended up with this really smooth, great looking final collaboration and, you know, bringing people out from Texas years later, um, yeah. all of that sort of thing that we were talking about earlier, where, you know, it's like, how much has this character changed? Or can I get that same character back? Or, you know, <laughs> is, did the building yeah. that we need to use to finish this get knocked down, you know, because stuff like that happens too. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it, yeah. It, it turned out so well that you ended up winning the silver award in the Chautauqua International Film Fest. How did that feel? Oh, it was, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Um, let alone like, you know, the chance to, you know, go to the East coast and see Pennsylvania while I'm at it and then nice. take a bus from, yeah, take a bus from Erie to Buffalo and then from Buffalo to Jamestown, a small town in uh, you know, 10,000 people, but it's the biggest town in Chautauqua County. Mm. And, you know, it's like on the, on the, dr- the, uh, the bus drive there, it was, it was just so amazing seeing this lush greenery and, and quaint towns that's kind of shouldering like, you know, Lake Erie. And it's like, I'm thinking to myself, cause there was traffic and for me, that traffic was good for me because I can really enjoy that. You know, the five hours, everyone else, I can know they're frustrated. These guys are like, they're regulars of Western New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, if, if this, uh, you know, if this film festival isn't that good, I can, at least I can say the, the magnificent views really took care of it and stuff. Right. So, the film festival but, wasn't so great, but the vacation was great, right? Yeah, yeah. But it turned out, it all turned out great. Yeah, yeah. Thanks to the wonderful uh, Diana Lenska, who started um, the Chautauqua International since 2016. I remember I, I checked into my hotel and then I was trying to get an Uber, but they don't do Uber over there because in, in Jamestown because it's a very small town. So I had to get a taxi. So I take my taxi I, and um, I remember that drive down first street in jamestown you know the sun is going down like i just thought to myself you know, same feeling i got from the, that bus drive through the lush greenery and now it's like wow i'm really in a different place now and i'm really excited and so you show up to the first the first night of the film festival and you know there's about a good 10 people there it's kind of like almost like an, an art gallery like on a tuesday in downtown la it was kind of <laughs> like that but really really friendly down-to-earth people uh they took me to uh, some breweries over there they, uh, they just kind of drove me around. Just really, really nice people. It kind of reminded me of the uh, the welcome vibe of like the Midwest or something like that. But how nice! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, two days later, yeah, I get uh, I get my award. And uh, to answer your question, it just uh, the screening was great. They had a good sound system, a, a pretty big screen, and it, uh, I saw it was a bigger audience. When I felt like I believe I was meant to be here, <laughs> and then you get the award, and like it felt it felt great. It felt you know. You know, all, everything came to this moment, but I also enjoyed the journey, the the challenges, and and getting this far as well. So you know, <laughs> that's amazing. That's such a great story, and I I love that. And discredit absolutely deserved that award. So I'll be putting a link in the show notes to the official trailer for discredit. And uh, we we hope to release it on Amazon Prime eventually. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Um. So I know that there were a few projects in between, but the, your next fiction film project is where we met uh, for the entry. And that was a solo project, which was in fact part of a larger project. And to me, it was kind of like, um, if you've seen Hellboy 2, The Golden Army, which is one of my favorite movies, there's an elven crown oh. in there and it's in three pieces and those three pieces need to come together to form fully form this powerful crown and i feel like the entry was like that because it's it was shot three different directors who were eventually going to bring their parts of the film together to create one longer film how did the idea of linking three parts of a story that were written and directed by different people come about? We had a uh, we had a meeting at uh, Spires in Lawndale, and uh, Jerry, 
who who I met at the uh, South Bay uh, Filmmakers Group, he wanted to invite us uh, for a meeting. He didn't tell us what it's going to be, but he just wanted to invite me and this other uh, cinematographer named uh, Vince Taruk. And so Jerry go ahead and goes ahead and uh, tells this. Uh, I have an idea for a project. I'm going to say I'm going to say this story, and then you're going to continue. So Jerry, the Jerry J. Cunningham goes, okay, a uh, a woman parks into a parking garage, and she's carrying a box. Um, she gets out. She walks out of the parking structure, and then he switches to me. And this is when I take over, and I say a woman leaves the parking structure, looks around a deserted, uh, you know, empty city, and walks into an old building. And then Vince goes in and say the the lady walks into an old building, an old apartment, walks up the stairs, goes inside the goes inside the door, inside the door. She hangs a left into another door, and she sees herself in the bedroom, uh, lying down, and uh, she's a corpse. And after that, we just kept developing it. We we thought about it. You know, let's let's shoot this in about a good um, three months from now. From you know, from writing it, to casting it, and and, and get into production. So, on the day of uh, casting, a lot of we had a lot of uh, about tw- twenty four actresses uh, showed up to our uh, casting event, and then we had a uh, conference call a couple of days later because we're still deciding on who we're going to use, and that's when the project sort of took a turn because Jerry wanted this actress and I wanted this actress. And so Jerry said, you know what, you can go ahead, you can do a separate one. And uh, that's where we went from there. And that's when you ended up with Renee Whitehouse. Yeah, yeah. I chose Renee because she had this look I was going for. And the look that first came to mind when we had this talk at Spires was this uh, Russian or uh, French girl, you know, wearing shades. And she has really something on her mind, like kind of disturbed, like, I don't want to be here. I just want to get this over with. So that's, that's the first thing I had in mind. So, and I, I like to share, there was a, a lot of actresses who had, you know, crazy track records. Like they were performed on this, this, like, you know, amazing, amazing track record. Renee, I believe she has good experience in like theater and stuff like that. She has the fundamentals down, but something about it was her presence that I saw that like, you know, this is going to be the one right here. And I, yeah, that's why I chose Renee. Yeah, she had a really powerful presence. And I think you made such a great choice with her. Um, I know that she's she's now a world traveler. She's gone on to get a master's uh, in archaeology. She's a PhD candidate now for history and and art. And uh, she's also an adventure writer and a freelance photographer. And uh, just, you know, every time I, I see something that she's doing, she's in a different place of the world. So <laughs> it's really amazing keeping up with her. But um, I mention all of that because she's so intrepid and fearless and, and inquisitive and curious. And that was a lot that was required of this character because it was a non-speaking part. So there, all of the... All of the action and the whole story came from her movements, from her approach to each one of the situations and uh, her facial expressions throughout. So I think you did a really good job with her. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I have described the entry as like a well-crafted mood and technique piece, clearly with everything that I just said. And it's got this sinister supernatural angle to it. And you've described it as a hypnotic piece. What do you mean by that? And what was your inspiration for creating this section of the three-piece puzzle the way you did? To me, it's hypnotic with its pacing. It was a very deliberate pacing. Uh, it's also hypnotic to me because I've I've had dreams where these dreams were they would, I felt like the, I have these dreams I would last like really long time like you know it was, felt like a three hour experience just walking around in certain events and I wake up and it's like one in the morning <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's I wanted to make it feel a lot longer than it should be 
I want to locate you within this woman's life within real time. I didn't want people to like passively watch it, but I wanted I wanted you in her shoes. I was, I really wanted to extend those those static moments or those reflective moments with with Renee a little longer without regards for efficiency or economy, but really we are with her thoughts as as well as with her dynamic moments. So, you know, I didn't want to put any flash forwards or, or flashbacks. And then you don't really hear any music until until like the, the third act. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that kind of approach, I kind of got that from uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's blow up where you, you don't hear any any music except for the music that's playing in the background and how you just feel like you're you're there with with the characters it's, just, it's very it's very quiet it's very silent and it's one of those movies kind of it just kind of haunted me it's like i remember these these images that just kind of stay with you and uh for the audiences listening uh, blow up is a, a film from the late 19 from 1966 in the movie it's when the photographer he's he's in the studio and he's looking at the photos when he's dissecting the photos he's seeing what really happened and there was perhaps a murder that went down so that was kind of what i was inspired by and um the location that we filmed at <laughs> uh thanks to you the location kind of reminded me something of that you see in like the old black and white films uh um something from maybe chinatown perhaps i mean more fast forward to like the 70s like kind of this film noir vibe like the spanish location so a little bit of uh antonioni a little bit of polanski in there as well yeah that's a nice tribute and it does have that i would say like that intimate quality that you're talking about where you're right there with the person it's a great film what are your future plans with it because i know that it's been officially selected by a number of film festivals including the culver city film festival in 2018 where i had the honor of joining you and some of the other players that were able to put this project together where do you see the entry going I'm going to see how it, how it does on like digital platforms. If I can really find that, that niche, that audience. And, you know, if, if the budget is right, if the schedule aligns, I would be really excited to shoot the, uh, the beginning part. And then the third act this is the first act and the second act. Yeah, that would be great. <laughs> um, I would like to see that. Uh, it's a good story. And, you know, something that you just mentioned was shooting the beginning as well as more after the part that you shot is that it did start out as three projects, but then it deviated from that initial idea as you each worked on your parts and became individual projects. Yeah. Yeah. So I know you've also worked as a director on a few documentaries, including one on the B-Boys or the breakdancing community, which is in Cerritos' little India area. It's called I Am The Deuce, and it focuses on breakdancers and the clothing fashion entrepreneur uh, named Sean Milani. How did this collaboration with producer Trish Kuyong, I, I don't know if I'm if I'm just totally murdering her name, so I apologize for that if you could correct me on that. How did that come about? I'm glad you bring this up. So if, if we go back to much earlier time, I, to 2013, I have a friend named Emil. We were part of the uh, the CSUOB, you know, Breakdancers Club, and his uh, girlfriend is a producer. So she has some kind of yeah. producing experience and she she wanted to bring me on board to do something local in, in the community. Emil was part of me and Emil are part of. So she reached out her first choice for this series for this for this highlighting businesses was Sean Milani, who has a store called The Deuce. And she reached out to me if I wanted to film it. I was excited about it. We had several meetings. I think a week before shooting it, before the first day, she asked if I wanted to direct it. So that that's how it came about. So she already had the story, of course, which is the way that a lot of these projects end up before you're asked to be the director of or the DP or, you know, whichever part you're being asked to participate in. When you looked at that story, what was your vision in making Sean's story come alive? My vision was to uh, capture Sean's day-to-day -day challenges as a business owner, a father of a newborn who really has it together, and also being a uh, 
Oh, let me let me go back a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so my, my vision was capturing Sean's B boy fusion owning a fashion business. The I know B-boy. I know the location too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for our listeners, B boy is, is a real term for like you know break dancers. That in and of itself is an exciting angle because there's so much that goes into the rehearsals, the choreography, the actual performances. Yeah. <laughs> it was a big part of my um, early 2000 hobbies and exercise as well. And just being part of that culture, a lot of good people I've met and keep in touch to this day. Yeah. Do you still do some break dancing? I can do the more uh, laid back stuff on the uh, on the floor with like the footwork and, and the crazy legs. Yeah, I kind of come down with like the the more dynamic stuff that's really popular. Like, you know, you see like in the uh, Olympics and stuff with like flares and uh, spinning handstands. Yeah, I, I guess I still, I, you know, when the opportunity presents itself, just like what Sean says in the documentary, I think you're never too old to be a breakdancer or, or b-boy. So. <laughs> yeah, I agree. What a great, I don't want to call it a hobby, but, you know, just what a great interest to get into. Uh, you know, yeah. It really takes a lot of focus, too, and so much creativity in that focus. And you still keep in touch with the Milani family? You know, after watching it again recently, I'm going to reach out to them again. Very, very nice family. Yeah. And, you know, I know Sean, me and Sean know each other in, you know, in dance circles, at clubs. So, you know, we know we know each other's dance style. So it'd be nice to catch up with him again. <laughs> that would be awesome. Definitely. Maybe a part two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, as far as I know, uh, I think the deuce might still be in hiatus or I could be wrong. But uh, Sean Milani has a lot of skills that he might bring it back. So. We'll see what happens. He might he might manifest something else, but definitely a lot of good memories at the Deuce. Uh, we used to break dance in the back room uh, before I shot that documentary. So, <laughs> oh wow, yeah, yeah back in the 2012s that time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very cool. Some good memories for sure. So you know, this kind of goes hand in hand with break dancing because it's very physical. You also shot a short promo documentary for MMA fighter Anthony Formoso, which is called Chapter 1.5 Team Formoso. And its purpose was to promote an upcoming fight for Anthony. How did you come up with that idea? We were at a bar in downtown Long Beach. I think it's called the Dash Bar. We met up for some drinks. He tells me his, his fight's coming up. And somehow at the end of the night, our conversation started like I should be. It was a gradual decision for me, but I was like, maybe we could, you could do like some kind of a promotional thing, which would be his very first promo. Being, I think he's already two fights in. And so I think I was planning to capture his third fight. This was kind of in a weird place for me because I think I, I finished Discredit and I'm still uncertain uh, about which festival I was going to get in for Discredit as we rewind back to Discredit. So, you know, it would be nice to do something different. It was a gradual decision. I think I emailed him like three days later, like, hey, man, let's do it. I'm going to go over your house and I'm going to interview you on the spot. And uh, yeah, he just uh, he just went forward. The first time I shot it, I just uh, the, like the interview stuff. I didn't tell him what I was going to ask him. I just went straight in. So. A lot of those moments are just pretty much in the moment. And so that that's how it came about in the initial stages. It's got, definitely has that extemporaneous quality about it, which is really cool. And the other thing that's super cool about it is it was your first project as a DP. Um, what was your focus to bringing it to life? And, and what was your thinking in uh, shooting this particular documentary? My focus on bringing this to life was trying to get into the mindset of Anthony and his team uh, during his trip from uh, Long Beach to San Diego and and back to Long Beach is his hometown that he really loves. And uh, my shooting approach as a DP was, okay, I guess coming from narrative, I want to make this look almost like if I was shooting like, you know, movie scenes. If Anthony was hanging out with his boys, I would kind of let the boys like, hey, you guys just do your thing. I'm not here. I would just try to... Uh, be authentic as I can, just just trying to like film, you know, in the moment. So I was trying to be more, more uh, cognizant with the camera angles, with the compositions. Yeah, it's got more of, again, an intimate feel. I think that that's what a lot of your films have is that intimate feel versus, you know, the excited kind of in your face quality that you see with a lot of fighting <laughs> promos. 
So it allows you to get to know who Anthony is. And one of the most endearing aspects of this promo is that Mia, who is Anthony's dog, ended up being such a key character in the film. How did that happen? That happened by just Mia is just uh, Anthony's uh, right hand partner. She follows Anthony when he goes for a jog, when he teaches yoga at the beach, when he trains, you know, getting some some food somewhere locally in downtown. So it's just she's just a part of his life ever since. And she's very like uh, very self-reliant, very independent dog. Yeah, I'd like to share a story. One time when we were in San Diego at our first night, we were driving up uh, the place we were going to sleep at. It was a good friend of Anthony, Nick, and his, his wife, Christine. So we stayed over there. It was like kind of a few hairpin turns up the hill somewhere in inland San Diego. And we were arriving there at night. You know that feeling when you arrive late night at some remote area? And, uh, yeah, it's a little disorienting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we load in and Anthony's like, where's where's Mia? Because Mia was sitting on my passenger. I guess I'm kind of responsible now, right? Because she was sitting by me and, and I was looking for her. <laughs> well, eventually she comes out behind the bushes like 10 minutes later. So we, we find her. <laughs> so, But yeah, Mia, Mia is a big part of the story. And I'm, I'm glad you noticed. I never got that, that feedback before. Yeah, <laughs> it really added another layer of personality to the promo. So I really enjoyed that. And uh, speaking of, dogs, yeah, I know we were talking about Mia dog. earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Tootsie's like, you are not going to record without having me say hello. Exactly, right? <laughs> My uh, oldest dog, he turned uh, 16 last January. Uh, he's a white Maltese. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm still happy to have him around since 2006 so <laughs> oh my gosh yeah because yeah, i know you're all about the animals too so you know. <laughs> oh totally yeah i tried to close the door i almost like shut the door and then i'm like no better just leave it cracked and the cat's already in here so <laughs> that wow. is so awesome so you've had him around for what well, i'm gonna have to do the math here 16 years yeah yeah right? before, before i got into cal state long beach uh, film program so it you know, a, lot, a lot's happened since then. And, and so I'm glad he's still around. And it's a sense of renewal every time I see him. Like, I pet his hair. And it's like, hey, man, thanks for being with us for this long. Hopefully you can get, make it to 20. <laughs> and he's doing right? okay. He's, yeah, he's doing all right. You just mentioned that you were shooting from Long Beach to San Diego and back to Long Beach. What were some of the challenges of spreading that project across so much geographical space? Some, some of the challenges when you have those kind of locations – is uh, Anthony lived in San Diego for two years prior to going back to Long Beach. So he has he has a lot of friends that we could stay at. And they were like real places. And it's not like we were going to go like, you know, couch surfing. It was like real places we can hang out at, like the place we stayed up in the hill. He We had like a game plan. And it's like, okay, we're going to, when we go to San Diego, we knew we we're going to go to the barbershop because he had to get a haircut. That's kind of like the main things that fighters go through before preparing for the fight. After the barbershop, he would go to meet some friends at Pacific Beach, and then he will we'll do some training over there. So we had like kind of a, a general game plan, uh, who we're going to interview, who he's going to meet. I guess some early challenges as uh, the, the director and DP, I guess you have to uh, be grounded because, you know, you, you're going to be in some situations, um, you know, in a documentary because, you know, we're, we're in Long Beach, we're in San Diego. You'll be in situations where there's a lot of partying in the background. <laughs> and it wasn't a challenge for me, but I just know like, okay, I, I'm going to, I'm going to focus. I'm going to film what's needed and I'm not going to drink until I transfer all my footage and everything's backed up. So I guess what I could say to other filmmakers, especially upcoming filmmakers is if you're in film gear mode, you have, to, and you're in certain conditions, you just gotta, you gotta have that discipline to, to, Hey, I'm here to make the movie. I'm here to get home safe. I'm here to transfer the footage when I get back. So you just got to have that. This that discipline can take you a long way For if you're sure. working in you know these kind of projects. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That um, you've got to set all of those other things aside to be able to stay on your game because really, you know, even if you just have a beer, everybody thinks that that's okay, but it's going to make you tired. It's going to slow down your reaction time. It's going to affect your enthusiasm and initiative to get stuff done now in the moment, you know, and, 
And then, like you said, if there's partying going on in the background, it's also going to increase the likelihood that you're going to go off and join your friends and rather than fi- finishing the project at hand. So I think that is... As much as it's kind of like, oh man, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> type of advice, you know? Yeah. <laughs> it's really, really good advice because the focus is to have a finished, really good looking, polished project. And um, when that's done, then you can go and have your beer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good advice. So um, the big question, I think after all of this talk about this MMA fight, how did he do in that fight? He won. Oh, it was a nice, nice clean round. I think in the, uh, I think in the second, I think probably the second or third round from what I recall. Well, is he still fighting? He's, um, I think he's taking a temporary break for now. He, he took, I think he took a year off uh, because of the whole COVID situation. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, I think the, the, uh, the fight arenas, I think they are, they kind of lay low for a bit, but I think he's, uh, Anthony's doing well. As far as I know, he's, he's, uh, happily training, uh, other people at the beach as a, as a fight trainer, uh, men and women, especially Anthony has always continued to improve his, uh, his, his physical life as well, as well as his personal life. That's so awesome. What a great story. Um, so I'm just thinking about the fact that, you know, we've been talking about these films that have been written we know what the story is. We know what the characters are supposed to do. We know what the scenes look like, etc. And then you start shooting documentaries, which are a little more spontaneous, um, not as tightly written as the other films are. What are the most noted differences between those two, those two types of films? Some of the noted differences with fiction and documentary. In fiction, you're kind of going by the the main blueprint of how it's, how the movie's going to end up in the editing floor. And with documentary, you have so many angles <laughs> you can tell the story because you're just out there capturing the moment. You never you never, you never know what's going to happen. So you have a lot of spontaneity when when you're editing. Sounds like you're creating the story after the fact yeah you know, that's where you're tightening it and and kind of seeing what path you want to take with it yeah yeah that's right yeah how did you feel about the difference between directing versus shooting as far as the, the transition from from narrative to documentary i would say it felt great that you didn't have to go through all these meetings and, and getting locations for permits like i can just pick up a camera and just go with it. That's a big, big deal. Yeah. <laughs> so much, so, so much work with getting the permits. That's for sure. Yeah. So it really, it really, when I decided to, when I made that gradual process after having that drink with them to, to make this project, it's like, Hey, this, this is fun. You could just, you just take the camera out and like, like that. There's that, there's that sense of freedom. And there's the narrative part running behind my head. Like, okay, I got to make sure this is going to be a, a good shot. I'm not just shooting like fire hosing. I'm just like fire hosing is like when you're just shooting here, shooting there, and you're not really paying attention to the composition. So I try to have that in the back of my head, like, okay, let's make it nicely framed. And hopefully this is a better chance that this will be in the story. I'm not, I'm not just shooting for the sake of shooting it. I'm trying to think of stuff. I'm shooting on 16 millimeter film. <laughs> so trying to be a step ahead, see if this is going to work for the story. Uh, for the documentary but yeah it was it was really enjoyable just being out there in the field being safe and just you know you got to be respectful to the public especially if you're you're filming out there you know in the streets and stuff if, if i'm filming a scene with anthony walking i got to make sure all the pedestrians cross yeah i mean maybe they, they don't want to be in it so <laughs> so right. and sometimes you can't help it sometimes you can't help it but at the most part you want to you want to respect the location and respect the environment a, a lot of responsibility that goes into that and it's it's kind of like uh the eminem song lose yourself you get one shot right yeah yeah an opportunity <laughs> to seize everything you got in that moment <laughs> yeah yeah that's yeah, right there, there's no do-overs i mean there are, but you lose so much in that do-over when you go, oh, hang on, can you say that again, you know? And 
it's there's there's certain qualities that are lost when you uh, have to shoot something a second time. Sometimes it doesn't matter, and sometimes it really does. It makes it makes all the difference. So it's more of a one one shot and you're done. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So your most recent project is also a documentary. It's called Mexican Express, and it's currently in post production. It's a race story that follows the journey of the Esparza brothers from Long Beach, Rick and Fred, who built and raced a truck that was called the Mexican Express all throughout the 1960s. And it's a story of excitement and heartbreak and determination and wins in Long Beach and at the Lions Drag Strip, which was in Wilmington, California. How did you hear about this amazing story? Yeah, I love your intro, by the way, for Mexican Express. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I have a good friend named uh, Ed Moy, who I met at Catalina Festival in uh, 2014. Uh, both of our films uh, didn't get in, but we got to hang out in the VIP lounge. And nice. uh, he's, he submitted a film called Aviatrix, which eventually got awards uh, in preceding festivals, including Culver City. And That's he supported cool. my, yeah, he supported my film, like this credit. And uh, I think it was in 2018, Ed Moy got me involved with this uh, race car story. And it makes sense because he's from the Bay Area. He was, he was here temporarily in, in, in Southern California, finishing up some, some other festivals from his other movies. And it's, you know, it makes sense that I DP it because the story takes place in Long Beach and I'm from Long Beach. <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, you know, he kept, I kept it in the back of my head and uh, let's uh, overlap it with one of Anthony's fights in 2017 in Palm Springs. One of the, uh, the guy who's who going to film for Mexican Express, he lives in Palm Springs, uh, Rick Esparza. He's the youngest brother of Fred Esparza, the owner of the Mexican Express. So I meet Rick for the first time at the Agua Casino. My first time, like really meeting Rick. And he tells me, like, I'm excited you're going to shoot it. He's also from West Long Beach, which is where I grew up. Uh, basically, like ten blocks from my house. <laughs> no way. Yeah. Did, did you live in the same neighborhood at the same time? No, I think I think he he moved nineteen ninety six. So yeah, kind of like around the same time, kind of around the same time. Yeah, because I got here in nineteen eighty two, wow. and he left in nineteen ninety six. Yeah, and uh, I thought it was uh it was amazing. I, I had no idea he was from the West Side. You just you know when you know like okay, I'm gonna be working with this guy for a while. <laughs> That's super cool. And I also get the sense that the film has some elements from like the world's fastest Indian, which is a phenomenal film um, and Ford versus Ferrari in there. Uh. Like the idealism, the, de- the determination, that need for speed specifically. So <laughs> what was your inspiration for the cinematography in telling this story? There's there's not a lot of films I know that's shot in probably the lesser known part of Long Beach and the West Side. So I wanted to make it look solid, capture, you know, the landmarks, see some of the like the small businesses, like the taco trucks, and then the main artery. The historic artery of West Long Beach is a uh, Santa Fe Avenue, which stretches all the way to uh, the port of Long Beach. Mm-hmm. So I wanted to make sure I wanted to show what these brothers grew up from their neighborhood to the market where they found the race truck to uh, the Lions drag strip, what, what it used to be at the time, which is a container field now. And then driving down Santa Fe Avenue, ending at Rick's school where he got into a lot of trouble. <laughs> so just kind of filming like a, a day in a life. Yeah, yeah, it was a troublemaker. <laughs> oh, that's great. That um, energy that got him in trouble is also the energy that made him such a successful race car driver. That's right. That's right. If it wasn't for his, his older brother, Fred, who told him like, hey, man, if you want to help me in my race car, you got to stop hanging out at the park and, you know, beating, beating up people and stuff and get out stop hanging out with the gangs and stuff so wow. and that was that was back in the 60s i mean today yeah it's still prevalent unfortunately so i can, I can imagine how it was in the 60s yeah. and stuff so, so it's kind of like a, a saving grace for him yeah that's amazing so you shot and you directed and you edited the film 
on this, I mean, there's a lot of, it seems like there's a lot of driving, a lot of action. Um, there's also the interviewing process. What did you find to be the challenges of this film? Yeah, I like when you bring up uh, the word challenges, especially three challenges. I guess the uh, one of the main challenges was when we're editing it, we'll, we'll shoot here and there, edit, go back and shoot some more and edit, just try to like really craft the piece. And I remember I showed one of the uh, cut in the later stages, I showed it to Ed. At this point, Ed Moy uh, was already a consultant. We both co-directed on the first day and gradually he, he gave that project to me. So that's, that's another interesting uh, fact. But I guess to answer your the f- the first challenge was really trying to make sure it wasn't too information driven because I know for the families, they will enjoy it. The friends will enjoy it. But how can we re- really make this appeal to, you know, to the masses. And so Ed told me to, you know, go back to the coverage overview, get out index cards, write, okay, act one, act two, act three, what's really going to be the the driving force, how are we going to keep making it engaging, but still making it breathe each time. And he sent me like ton of movies, talk, ton of documentaries. I got a lot of awards. I kind of blanking on them right now, but um, he said, yeah, you just got to, try to like make it more engaging and stuff. I really took that to heart. And then I was able to get several people as a consultant, including uh, Damien Apunte from 4th Street Productions. He gave, he gave his take on it. Oh, yeah. Damien Apunte <laughs> is such a great guy to get for consulting on edits. He just does magnificent work. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So he, he was a big part of it as well as the, uh, Oh, back to the, uh, the cinematography question. He was he was great in capturing a, a lot of the uh, the aerial stuff in, in the film. Nice, as well. <laughs> nice. Um, what did you find gave you the most satisfaction in shooting this film? The most satisfaction in, in shooting this project was kind of being adopted into this this family with, with the Esparza family with, with you know Fred and his his wife hanging out with Rick a lot. I'm getting a chance to hang out with these people as they're living their full life, you know, and, you know, they just give you a lot of wisdom. Just, you know, as you always get a lot of good advice from uh, people in that age. I, it was one of those projects where, you know, it, it found me and I became really appreciated as the years went on. I just, I just can't, I got more excited, <laughs> like with every edit, like, how can I make this much better? How can I make this much better? And even though there was a lot of work, I was lucky to have this project thanks to Ed and met some wonderful people like, you know, Rick, Fred, his wife, and uh, especially you got to hang out with a historian, Long Beach, a California historian, Claudine Burnett. I got to hang out with her. I got to hang out with uh, Kenny Youngblood. I got to fly out to Las Vegas and interview him. He's a motorsports artist who knows a lot about the uh, Alliance drag strip. So I was just, it's just the overwhelming sense of learning the subculture, being, being part of it, hanging out with the real people and just how, how so nice these people were <laughs> to me. Yeah, you know, it's got a lot of uh, nostalgia to it and excitement too at the same time, just, you know, rich in history and personalities as well from the racers and everybody that was involved in it. Um, When will the film be released and where will people be able to watch it? Early to mid-June. Oh, cool. Okay, so that's right around the corner. Yeah, that's our target month. And uh, we're kind of looking, it's going to be on Amazon Prime. We ideally, you want to have it uh, simultaneously having a couple of uh, screenings at special venues. One is the uh, Long Beach Public Library. Nice. Yeah, and uh, we have some other car museums in mind. I know a lot of things are getting lifted now with with the restrictions, with the health restrictions. So I'll, uh, I'll we'll definitely keep you updated to get a chance to see it in the big screen. Absolutely. As soon as it's ready to go out, I will be posting information on the socials as well as the dot com and, you know, make sure that people can see this because I think it's going to be an outstanding film. You've got a kid who's kind of hanging out with gangs and you've got somebody else, you know, his brother finds his car. They come to get like, it's just all this unexpected stuff that ends up being this big, giant, amazing story. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Thank you. There's something like I wanted to say about, I would kind of rewind a bit, but I like how we're still on the topic of documentaries. Something I really enjoyed, if I'm comparing the two, 
It's that something that has in co- that I have in common is kind of like in fiction when you're working with like amazing actors and documentary when I'm filming and interviewing like the real people and their professions and how they grew up. It's just as ex- it's the same excitement. Um, and you know this as an interviewer with, with your program as well. I always just get good energy from people and you'll be surprised how a lot of people like to talk about themselves and their experiences and it's just so rich and uh, that's what I love about just just working with um, the documentaries and, and narrative. I see that uh, same that commonality where that same energy where, whether it be actors or you know real people I just I just love that energy. <laughs> For sure there is this great energy that's there about getting the story directly from the source and hearing the excitement in a person's voice. It's, it's so raw and realistic and relatable, just on the edge of your seat listening. So for sure, that's always really awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you, you probably have a lot of those experiences yourself, meeting so many people and interviewing them. I do. You know, I really enjoy listening to people tell the story of their lives. Uh, There's always something really interesting. There's always something to take away from it. It, It's just a great way of connecting with people and also validating that your experiences really are everybody's experiences and just... um, learning how somebody else got through through something similar is, is just really kind of magical to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> Didn't you do a couple of TED, TED Talks, Sue? <laughs> no, I haven't done any <laughs> TED Talks, but that is one of my goals. Yeah. You know, I think that that would be so awesome. And um, I don't know, like I'd been wanting to do podcasts for a really long time. I started oh. listening to them and I thought, you know, this is just great um i i tend to get tired of music pretty quickly and then sometimes i just need something to really stimulate my mind and i love human stories i love listening to people's stories about how they got somewhere or how they overcame something or you know whatever wow. and that's what the podcasts were offering and so i really got into Tim Ferriss. I don't know how I found him. He's got something like, I mean, I think he's pretty close to like 600 podcasts wow. at this point. Okay. And they're amazing. I mean, he's got like, you know, Naval Ravikant on there. He's got Tony Robbins, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's got just all of these super kick ass. He's got one on there with Robert Rodriguez talking about. El Mariachi. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it's a super, super good one. And I mean, he's got, you know, like a lot of people that he's talked to and they're big names. And so I listened to him and they all like right now I'm listening to the one with um, Joyce Carol Oates. Okay. Huge name in the literary world. And just listening to the caliber of her language just she like these gigantic words like i'm listening to her and she's like and the verisimilitude about blah 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 and just like (laughs) it just like rolls off her tongue and i'm like i don't think i've actually ever heard anybody use verisimilitude in a sentence that easily yeah and so it's really great and then she's talking about the process of writing and he's got a lot of authors on there and that sort of thing but he asks he asks questions that really get to the heart of what made somebody become who they are or or follow a career or come upon an idea and just take that ball and roll with it. And I thought, that's what I want to do with my friends because I just think, honestly, everybody that's in my life, I have some super amazing people. And what I find is I know that that just sounds really kind of like dramatic and, you know, a little bit too bubbly and stuff, but it's not. And I find that a lot of people don't realize how amazing they are because we're all just kind of plugging away with life, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to make a film and you go and you make your film, but you're so busy 
in the details of making a film and you're so busy in the details of making sure that you've got your cast and you've got your crew and you've got the editing process going and now you've got to take off and and get it all to film festivals and yeah. let people know about it and market it and all of this stuff. Yeah. You're it's not like stopping that. to right <laughs> it's like advanced fundamentals you know you know it's just it's just it's just prep production and post and distribution but it's like you gotta you gotta be on another level sometimes a lot of those steps even though it's kind of like those four steps but it was like a lot of steps in those steps kind of thing <laughs> there are you can get really mired in the detail and yeah when you're that focused on what you're doing you're just doing it this is just life but you don't realize that other people are looking at you and going holy cow this is like you said on another level and um and so i wanted to show people you know like these people all of these people are on another level (laughs) in one regard or another so that's how the podcast ended up coming uh becoming what it is right now it's you know like modeling it a bit after tim ferris modeling it a bit after Emma Chamberlain, who mm, is like, yeah, yeah, a really young trendsetter. And she's got her own podcast and it's kind of, it, it's about her mostly, but it's about her in a way that kind of educates the world. Um, so it's kind of fun to listen to. And I'm like, hey, you know, I kind of like that cozy, my whole week was a mess. And let me tell you about it because it's so funny type of attitude. Uh, that she has. So I was trying to meld those together along with, you know, my personality where I think everything is either hilarious or absolutely amazing. No, I I like, I like what you're doing. You're you're building relationships as people like when they hear you, they kind of get a, they get a sense of who you are. And I, and I, and I know who you are. And I, when I listen to your podcast, like, yeah, this is, this is congruent with who you are. So it's good. (laughs) I've listened to it. Thank you. But, um, (laughs) but you know, it's a, it's a, process just like anything and i think it's getting better yeah yeah i could see that with the with the documentaries for you being the same sort of thing and i know um that you've got another project at at the at least i thought that's what i saw is that you've got an upcoming project that's also a documentary and it's untitled right now oh um yeah thank you for uh looking that up um that's that's kind of going to be one of my it might be the next one or it might be the second project going back into the narrative realm. Oh, okay. Yeah. This was a s- screenplay I, I developed, I think it was in 2016. It's a, it's a road trip story that takes place right a coastal town by Highway 101. Mm-hmm. I submitted the screenplay to the Oaxaca Film Festival in 2018. They accepted it as one of the finalists, as one of many finalists which was basically an invitation to have it reviewed within a round table, a key scene from the script. You're going to pitch your story in, in front of a, you know, a good amount of people after the festival, someone's going to call you and give you a kind of one-on-one, like, here's what we can do. Here's how we can change the structure, you know, give us from an, another industry pro. And that, that's what happened. And uh, it was, it was an amazing experience. So this was like, I mean, if, if I were to compare it to Chautauqua international in New York, they were both equally amazing experiences. Chautauqua, I got I got the silver award for discredit. This one, I didn't get an award, but I got a lot of feedback. It was a head start for this screenplay, and it just felt good taking that little step to get somewhere in the door to see where the screenplay is going. Kind of like in discredit when I decided to start location scouting at the at the Civic Center. This was a nice step for okay, let's see where this bigger screenplay, much more bigger than discredit, will will take me if I take the first step. I mean, that's a little bit of a nail biter too, because you have to do that in front of so many people and, and it's just an idea. And it just often feels like it's just an idea among thousands of really good ideas because it it's, you have to be really good at your craft to get into a lot of these festivals. So I know that that's a little bit nerve wracking, but I think you went to Oaxaca. That's right. You? Yeah, yeah. 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 What an amazing trip. Like that's the best souvenir yeah, ever, yeah. <laughs> that you could get from anything. Yeah. And right? some of the friendliest people there. I really felt like they're sincerely want us to have a good time. It was uh <laughs> it was great. Yeah. I love that. Oh the food. 
<laughs> yeah, and the food. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Oaxacan food is really delicious, amazing food. I actually have a story about that. This is ages ago. I was a very picky eater, <laughs> which means that like I basically pretty much ate nothing. <laughs> but we ended up going to Mexico with this couple and we stopped at a restaurant that was pretty amazing. And the guy, Jesus, that we were with, knew everybody in this restaurant and everybody in this town. And so he didn't even order off the menu. He was just ordering all of this different food that was coming to the table. And they made like fresh guacamole on the side, it just very elaborate entertainment type of, you know, kind of like when you go to Benihana's or something and the chefs are back there just, you know, chopping stuff up and the knives are flying and they catch them and that sort of thing. <laughs> and so here's this um, guacamole being made at the table side. And I didn't like guacamole. I bet you that was the best guacamole in the world. I love guacamole now. Um, so I didn't eat the guacamole. And, you know, he was a little bit just kind of concerned. And I said, No, don't worry about it. I just don't like guacamole. Well, the next thing they did was he ordered a Caesar salad, and they made it table side. And it was this huge production. And I said, Yeah, I don't like Caesar salad. So he goes, Well, you have to eat something, I'm going to order something special for you. And I'm going, No, 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 don't order me anything special. I'll find something in that. And he's like, No, 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 I really need you to eat something. So I said, well, what did you order? He goes, it's a surprise. You're going to love it. He was so excited to order something very special for me. And I was <laughs> terrified. And so finally, I'm like, you really have to tell me what you ordered. And he goes, well, there are these very special wheat la coche empanadas. And I go, what's wheat la coche? And he goes, it's a fungus that grows on corn. Those were his exact words. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, I can't believe that he just ordered me fungus that grows on corn. This sounds horrible. <laughs> and it's a good thing that I didn't know what they call it here in the States because they call it corn smut. And it is a fungus and it ruins, supposedly it ruins the corn. But in Mexico and the Oaxaca areas and many areas of Mexico, they eat this. It's, it's basically yeah. a mushroom. So here comes this platter of empanadas. And I'm thinking, I can't say no, because everybody's looking at me and I'm trying to share them. And I cut into one of them and it was just like this river of blackness that came out of the middle of this empanada. And I thought I was going to die, but <laughs> I did take a deep breath. I steeled my courage and I took a bite. It was the most delicious thing that I had ever tried in my entire <laughs> life. And um, it was, <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> you would never know it. And so these mushrooms or this fungus takes on the flavor of the corn and it's also nutty at the yeah. same time. And they mixed it up with some cheese, which is why it was like this black river coming out of this empanada. So it was like cheese and mushrooms and this essence of corn and phenomenal, <laughs> phenomenal stuff. So, um, yeah, they do have very good cuisine there. That's for sure. Wow. Talking about a, a rich experience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. I, I think that's where I started to, you know, that kind of like pushed me over the edge into getting closer to where I am now, where it doesn't matter what you put in front of me. I'm pretty much going to eat it. Yeah. AKA the, <laughs> I am not picking AKA the, yeah. devour it. I think. <laughs> devour it. Yeah. <laughs> Seafood. I see food and I eat it. Yeah. yeah. It's, I am not picky anymore. It's like, wow, really? Let me try that. Yeah. You know? yeah. So, um, oh, I wanted to ask you if you had one thing, I know that we already shared the, you know, remain focused until you're done and then go and party <laughs> um, bit. But if you had advice for up and coming filmmakers, what would it be? Yeah. So I, I guess if I were to give uh, someone, someone who's getting into film uh, three things, I would, I would say that the first one would be uh, perseverance. So what does that really mean? I'm kind of thinking like perseverance and like the fundamental sense from from prep to production to post-production to distribution and just kind of knowing like you kind of want to you don't have to be amazing at each one when you're starting out, but kind of 
get the fundamentals, you know, during prep time while you're meeting your, your actors. And there's going to be a time where like tomorrow's the first day of shooting and I, I it's already like one in the morning. You just know that. <laughs> that happens so much. Yeah. You feel like you're already at the finish line, but nope. It's found for round two. That's part of the checklist. Now you're going to production, reset those emotions, you know, have someone drive you to the set if, if you're not ready to drive. So, you know, be safe. Um, for sure. Yeah. And then there's like stuff like fundamentals, like you want to make sure like in prep you have equipment check the day before, you know, a couple of days before shooting. You want to make sure you have a, a good maybe a DIT or a third camera assistant who knows he's going to able to you're shooting on film knows how to puts it back you know into the, the black bag or if you're shooting on digital which is very popular now knows how to transfer the footage safely and maybe do a triple backup so the worst thing you could have is like everyone has a great shooting day you know everyone goes home safe but like the tr- the footage isn't able to transfer after production <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah that is really a bad <laughs> thing i mean you put all of that out there. It's it's like, just imagine you have just finished some big document project and your computer crashes. It's that same feeling that just that pit in your stomach that it's not getting transferred over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to get like those fundamentals ahead of time, at least in prep. So your production is smooth, you know, and, and in production, there's like, there's always like these two things. It's like, get the shots and then make sure everyone gets home safe. That's, that's the most important thing. <laughs> it was just two things in production and then, Oh yeah. Transferring sure. the footage, obviously. And then, you know, when you have post-production and make sure you have a schedule when you're, when you're editing it, try to make sure, okay, I gotta get scene scene one by this time or scene two by this week. So, you know, you're not dragging your feet. And when you're done with the film, you want to make sure you have some kind of distribution plan, or at least have an idea of it. Cause you can make this really amazing film, you know, you persevered, you know, prep, production, post-production, you made this amazing film and it only gets seen by your family and friends, but you want to get it out there, have a marketing strategy so it could, you know, you have some kind of budget for the film festival so it doesn't just play at one film festival, but it gets out into a lot. So um, it's, that's always that's always good to do right away before putting it online right away, which is nice too if you want to do that right away, but it's the festival experience is always, is always nice, you know, it's seeing it in a movie theater. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. so that, that's my take on perseverance. Just try to like, you know, think about your checklist from prep to production, post-production and distribution. Just know a little bit of that stuff. And you're going to get better each time when you, you gain these new layers of skills. You know, make sure you, you put the amount of A game through each one. So you have a nice, a nice balance through it. And uh, so that's number one is perseverance through the checklist. The second one is uh, education. Try to watch films of your favorite directors find out your favorite directors favorite films find out who they're inspired by uh try to find a way to take an uh, elective film class it'll definitely help you learn about the appreciation of you know film and how it got started and if you can go to film school that would, if you have that luxury if you have that time and that energy that would, that would be even amazing but i think you can still not go to film school and still be an amazing talented filmmaker and that, that's number two is the, the education part, just having that appreciation, learning about the theory in film. And uh, number three, just uh, having ideas that you're serious about, ideas that you're serious that you're going to keep going no matter what. And, and, you know, that can be an endless font if you just continue to cultivate it, don't throw any idea away because that idea that might seem silly can turn into something really amazing. And I think just to quote Sean Milani, as you said earlier, you're never too old to break dance and you're never too old to create a film and uh, create that magic. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So um, when you're making films, I, I love all of that advice. I mean, that is really thorough, really good advice for, um, any up and coming filmmaker what do you, Danny Miguel, hope to impart to your audience when you're making films? What is your goal in creating this really amazing media to transport people into another world for a little Thank while? Thank you. I like how you said transports. It's just, 
this is what we do as as, as filmmakers. Yeah, I love that word. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So to answer that, what I hope to impart on audiences is to hopefully impact them in some way that may influence their personal life indirectly, and it maybe it can uplift them the same way that movies have done for me in you know in the eighties and the nineties. That that feeling when you after you just watched a movie, you're leaving the theater with your family or your friends. You just share this experience with a bunch of people in the audiences, and just that feeling when you're walking out, like you know what, there's something I could probably change in my life. You know, so that's. That's what I want to impart with with audiences. That, that there's there's some hope out there, you know. Whatever they may be going through, or they might be feeling good already, and maybe they can just they can feel good and they can they can share the story with other people, you know. And and hopefully it resonated with them. I like that, and I think that hope that you hope to impart on others really, to me, says a lot about your production company, which is called State of Ability. How did it get that name? Oh, that's funny how you brought that up. I like that. Going back to breakdancing, we, we were coming up with uh, different names of what we we're going to name our, our crew back in the early 2000s. This was also part of like, you know, the Long Beach and Cerritos, you know, Sean's era and in, in at that time. And I came up with State of Ability as, as, <laughs> as a crew name back when I was at Long Beach City College. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just I just like how it sounds. I didn't know what it meant at the time, and I I thought about it years later, uh, using it for a production name when I was doing like my early 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 short films pre discredit around two thousand seven. It means when you're when you're in that zone, when you have that confidence that you can just keep going, and everything in the background just fades. It's just you in the moment. You are having momentum, that you have the confidence to to pick yourself up and fulfill your goals. Mm -hmm. It's got that anything's possible quality to it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I like that. Um, If you had one thing to share with the world, anything, it it could be about film. It could be about breakdancing. It could be about dogs, cats, since we've been interrupted (laughs) by both (laughs) during whatever whatever out there what would it be that you would share with the world i would say uh my philosophy is to always express yourself express your vision always let it come from your heart that's going to determine your effortless in such a complex life that we live in it's it's what confucius said he said if you find a job that you love you you don't have to work at all so if you just if you're always expressing yourself from your heart, you're expressing your vision, you know, it's it's going to be effortless. You know, it's it's going to send good vibes to people and it's going to reciprocate back, you know. <laughs> and it's being true, it's being authentic. For sure. I love that. That alone is worth listening to this episode. That was just awesome. Um thank you for that. I uh I really enjoyed being on uh on this episode. Uh, I believe this is my first podcast and uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. Thank you for uh, everyone listening out there. Thank you so much for your kind words. I always love catching up with you. I really admire how thoughtful you are about your approaches, how thorough you are. It seems like, you know, not just in film with having all of these different approaches and, and explanations about what perseverance means. I feel like you use that same approach, that same perseverance in everything in life. And I'm so happy that we're friends. I will put links to everything that we talked about today in the show notes, everything that I'm able to link up. And I was thinking about doing that, you know, putting the password on there for the show notes, the entry and discredit, because I only had the music for uh, for festivals. You know, ideally, it would be great to see like, oh, you can you can buy it on Amazon, you know, but but none of these films are on Amazon yet. That's what I meant with uh, this, yeah, discredit and the entry with the music. Uh, yeah, it's all about the music rights. There was so much good stuff in this episode. No matter what your interest is, whether it's filmmaking, breakdancing, podcasting, or any other creative endeavor, there was sure to be some words of wisdom and inspiration from Danny in this episode. I will be posting links to the trailers for Discredit, the entry and the soon to be released Mexican Express, as well as links to I Am the Deuce and Chapter 1.5 Team Formosa. 
As always, I will also be posting links to everything else that we talked about in the show notes. So please continue to send me your questions, your suggestions. I love hearing from you. And don't forget to take a moment to rate this episode. It only takes seconds and your rating will help move this podcast closer to the top of searches so that my friends and I can reach more people. I'm so looking forward to sharing the upcoming In the Company of Friends talks with you. And also be sure to follow me on the socials and the dot com all at the Queen Trail podcast. That's T-H-E-Q-U-A-I-N-T-R-E-L-L-E podcast. I am Syl Annan, the Queen Trail. And until next time, I wish you passion, grace, adventure, drive, spontaneity, elegance, and beauty.